This is Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast that gives you hope in the gospel as an anchor for your soul. Brought to you from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Our second reading is from Genesis. We are looking at the unexpected ways that we find God. And we started in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. We went on to Abraham. Then we went to Jacob. And now we are with the Joseph story. It is found on page 31 of your Pew Bible. We will begin with Genesis 37, verse 1. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bela and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream that I dreamed. There were many binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright, and and then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. And now we're at the very end of Joseph's life. And in Genesis chapter 50, beginning with verse 15 of your pew Bible, We begin. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, and they fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them speaking kindly to them. Let us pray. Lord, by your intention, because it's your word, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart delight you, please you, and fulfill the purpose for which you have intended them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Twenty-five years ago, someone calculated add up to years of our life. By the time we're 70, here's what the calculation showed. 20 years, we will be sleeping. 
20 years we will be working, seven years playing, six years eating, five years getting dressed and ready in the morning, five years on the telephone, and four years in traffic, three years waiting for someone, and about a year and a half in church. Now, that was 25 years ago. When we are in the fellowship hour together, I encourage you to ask anyone, how are your numbers changed? Because there may be more traffic or more work or less sleep. Who knows? More eating? I don't know. How you experience time depends on whether we value it. If we enjoy or value what we're doing, it just seems like time flies. I don't know if, what that is for you. If you dislike or devalue what you're doing, it's as if time is sitting in a wheelchair in a convalescent home and there's no one to push you. Just uh, go slow. A man named Bob went to his doctor only to hear that there was bad news from all the tests from his annual physical. He had a terminal illness and he only had six months to live. Bob asked, is there anything I can do? Any experimental drug or any kind of treatment? The doctor thought for a moment. There is one thing you can do. You can move out to the country and buy a pig farm. And you can raise pigs. You can find a widow who has 14 or 15 children and marry her and bring them all out to the farm to help with the pigs. Now, Bob looked puzzled. He said, now how will that help me live longer? The doctor replied, it won't, but it will seem like the longest six months of your life. <laughs> Are you in the longest six months of your life or the longest season of your life? As we look at Joseph's life, we're going to find that God and our life's purpose can come together. And by asking this question, why does God take so long to help, we will learn from Joseph's story that God's timing is not ours, that God's timing is purposeful, and that God's timing is perfect. Let's look at God's timing is not ours. We have to begin with a, an overview or let's say a summary of Joseph's life. Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Jacob and he was the favorite son. Jacob gives to Joseph this long robe which in some translations say it was a many colored, Joseph's technicolor dream coat, color dream coat. Long means that there's a big hem. Now, they didn't have male purses. Instead, you put your money in your hem. And so if you had a hem on a long robe, it meant that you had money to carry. And Jacob is showing to Joseph, you are the one who's going to run the estate. I entrust you with the funds. He had sleeves, which means you don't get to do manual labor. You are set apart for other purposes. You're going to administrate. You communicate. Joseph was the one who was dressed like royalty, treated like royalty. He had full access to his father, and he was the ambassador for his father, communicating his father's wishes to the other sons. I want you to remember that. We're going to pick that up again. Joseph's brothers hate him for this favoritism. And Joseph has two dreams. In 
all of Genesis, when there is a dream, it's God communicating directly to the person on behalf of God's purpose or plan. So Joseph has two dreams, which means it's really going to happen. Pharaoh has two dreams. It's really going to happen. And he shares this. Not maybe a good idea with those who don't like him, but he shares it with his brothers, and they hate him even more. The dream is that the brothers will one day bow down to him. Jacob sends his son Joseph to go find out how the brothers are doing when they're far away with the flocks, and they see him coming from a distance. And they they hate him so much they decide, we're going to kill the guy now that we're away from our father. They decide, we're going to kill the guy now that we're away from our father. One intervenes, Reuben, and he says, let's just throw him in a pit, a cistern that was dry. And they take off his coat, they throw him down, and we learn from Genesis 42, verse 21, that Joseph pleads in agony and tears to his brothers to spare him, to deliver him. Instead, they go and have a picnic lunch together. They harden their hearts That memory of his crying out to them haunts them forever. Joseph cries out, and no one answers. Why? Because God's timing is not ours. Now, I want to say that we should not think that God is responsible for Joseph being thrown in the pit. His brothers are responsible. Humans are not puppets on a string, in God's world, on stage. He doesn't use people, but he gives every one of us free will. Every one of us chooses. And we choose our, our, our lives, and we therefore choose the consequences. But what we find in Scripture is that there's sovereignty of God. You hear that word reign, sovereign. God is reigning over all, and in the middle of human choices, God is working his intention out. This is the mystery and the power of God. So we have Joseph in a pit, and no one answers. But we see the sovereignty of God at work. A merchant caravan of Midianites, those are the sons of Ishmael. They pass by, sons of Ishmael. They pass by, and the brothers, greedy, decide, no, I'm not going to kill the guy. I'm going to make money off him, and they sell their brother as a slave. He's taken down to Egypt, put on the block, and he's bought by a man named Potiphar, who's the captain of, of Pharaoh's guard. Joseph excels at his work. He applies himself with skill and wisdom, and the master takes notice. I want to stop here and ask you about your own work. If you were in a menial job, if you were in something that you really don't really prefer as your first, second, third, or fourth choice to do, how do you do it? Does it matter how you do work? We see from Joseph's life that not only does his master notice, but the master notices how we do our work, chief steward over his entire estate. That's when Potiphar's wife notices this young man in the house and begins to flirt and tries to seduce Joseph. Repeatedly, he says, no, I could not sin against God in this way. And her attraction turns to anger. She accuses Joseph of making advances. He's a foreigner, he's a slave, he's thrown into the dungeon, underground prison. Let's ask again, why does God take so long to help? Because God's timing is not ours. There in prison, Joseph's hard work, his behavior, finds favor with the jailer. He is given the responsibility of caring for all the other prisoners. And in God's sovereignty, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker are thrown into the dungeon. And so Joseph is serving them. 
They're downcast. He says, what's going on? They tell him that we both had a dream. He says, by God's help, I will interpret. And he shares what will happen. It comes true. The cupbearer is brought back up and goes back to Pharaoh's table. As he's going, Joseph says, remember me? I sure will. He doesn't. He totally forgets about, Jake, about Joseph. Joseph has no other human advocate on earth but this cupbearer, and he's forgotten. I don't know if you've ever been forgotten, overlooked, like out of sight, out of mind. If you've ever felt so sidelined, like, like no one was speaking a word on your behalf, for two more years. Why does God take so long to help? Because God's timing is not ours. God is not in a hurry. We move, however, at a different speed. Philip Brooks was the pastor at Trinity Church in Boston, he was known for his gentle spirit, his great patience. But one day, a man came into his study and saw Brooks pacing back and forth in anguish. He said, Dr. Brooks, what on earth is the matter? I'm in a hurry, he said, and God is not. You know what we are? We're a horn-honking people. There is a book, A Geography of Time. Robert Levine suggests that we name a new unit of time, Hawk Seconds. It's the time it takes for the light to change before the person behind you honks their horn. Are you in a hurry? And God is not? We value speed. We value efficiency. We value quickness. Just stand behind someone in a long grocery line, and when they are not ready with their money, you just find out if you are in a hurry. Waiting is bad. Getting what we want now is good. Is that true for you? Let's contrast this with God. Look at the top of your bulletin. Second Peter, Second Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. We find with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness. Did you hear that? A thousand years for God is like one day? Now, if you and I had a thousand years to do all that we need to do in one day, we wouldn't be in a hurry either. God is not slow. Hmm. In the original, that word means tardy or arriving late. So let's read this again. The Lord does not arrive on schedule. Whoever then trusts and obeys God, as Joseph did, is on schedule too. Let me say that again. Whoever trusts and obeys God, as Joseph did, is on schedule. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. In other words, Relax. Remember who is in charge here. So our first, first thing we learn from Jacob, Joseph, why does God take so long to help? Is because God's timing is not ours. The second thing we learn from Joseph is God's timing is purposeful. Be purposeful. Because of God's sovereignty, what happens has purpose or meaning. We are not to kill time. 
But we are to live as stewards to God with our time. God's timing has purpose. It's intentional. So Joseph went to Egypt in Potiphar's house. He learned to work with his hands. He learned the language and the culture. He began began to be skilled at stewarding someone else's property. He managed finances. He engaged in commerce. While in prison, Joseph learned to care for others. And in that tremendous setback of being forgotten, with the prospect of spending the rest of his life in prison, Joseph learned to live in the presence of God. God's time, what God does in us while we wait is as important as what it is we are waiting for. Now, many of you know that the church in China is the fastest, largest growing church of Christians, believers in the world today. It began largely through the underground church, the churches that were not sanctioned by the Chinese government after the Cultural Revolution. The name Wang Mingdao is the Chinese pastor credited for starting and developing that underground church movement. He was in prison, a dungeon, from 1955 until 1980, 25 years. A dungeon from 1955 until 1980, 25 years. Ming Dao said that there was nothing to do but to be present to God, which he found was actually everything. Summarizing what he learned in prison, Ming Dao discovered that God does things slowly. He works with the human heart. And it was in the prison cell that he learned the walking pace of God and his timing. Have you learned the walking pace of God and God's timing in your life? Why does God take so long to help? Because God's timing is purposeful. He's doing a work in the heart. He's doing a work in preparation. We witness the perfect timing of God on that sovereign day appointed by God. In Genesis 41, Pharaoh has two dreams. He doesn't know how to interpret them, neither do the magicians in Egypt. Immediately, the cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison. And Joseph is called up, and he shaves himself, he washes himself. But more importantly than his outward appearance, his mind and his heart are ready. He comes up, he hears the dream, the two dreams by Pharaoh, and he says, only... God can interpret. And then he begins to explain that Egypt will have seven years of bountiful harvest, followed by seven years of devastating famine. Joseph advises Pharaoh to begin storing up during the seven years of of plenty. Pharaoh sees no one as wise of plenty. Pharaoh sees no one as wise as Joseph. And he appoints him as the prime minister over the whole land. One day Joseph is in prison, the next day he's prime minister of Egypt. Why does God take so long to help? It's because God's timing is perfect. That word perfect in Greek is telos. It it means to get to the goal, complete the purpose. Let me illustrate. The young man came from an impoverished background and a hard scrabble existence. He saved up all he could and went deeply into debt, trying to launch a grocery startup. His partner had an alcohol problem. And the young man ended up so far in the hole that he he gave up on being in business though it took him more than a decade to pay off the cost. He studied law on his own. 
He ran for public office multiple times, only to be defeated time after time. By most people's definition, this man was a failure. But in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. Lincoln's life had prepared him to be God's leader of this nation at the worst time in our nation's history. And in his second inaugural address, Lincoln reflects on how God was at work in the Civil War in ways more mysterious and more profound than any human being could fathom. He learned that in those years. God's timing is perfect. He is not late. He is on schedule. Those who abide in him, who trust and obey him, are on schedule too. Listen to how Joseph reviews his life once his father Jacob has died. His brothers fear Joseph is now going to retaliate at last. We heard it read, do not be afraid. Even though you intended it for harm, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he has today. That word intended in the Hebrew is a concrete image. It's a picture word. Intended, meant, is the word to braid or to plait. You intended it for evil, but God was plaiting something else. You did this, but God's purposes are getting worked out. God's all in this. See? It's perfect. Why does God take so long to help? Because it's to help. Because his timing is perfect, and he will fulfill his goal. What's the application? Well, do you know that God's timing is not yours? What's happening then as you're waiting, as you're waiting on God's timing? In Potiphar's house, it was menial work. Do it with all your might as unto the Lord. Do you know that God's timing serves a purpose? In prison, what is your prison cell? Where is it that you're trapped Is it a broken heart? Is it a sickness? Are you forgotten by others? Joseph cared for others. You can open your heart and care for others too. So that you may be filled with the fullness of God who never fail you or forsake you. You are not forgotten and you are not alone. Do you know that God's timing is perfect? I said we would revisit the the royalty that Joseph was dressed in. This is the same royalty that's given to every one of us when we trust in Jesus, the Son of God, and we seek him for our salvation. We become children of God. He dresses us in the righteous robes of Christ We have full access to our Heavenly Father, direct access, and we're ambassadors in his name. It may take a long journey or a lot of trial for us until we know this to be the truth and our identity, but God's timing is perfect. Let us pray. The word that you have for us and the identity that you convey to us would be received by faith. In your name we pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you'd like more information about our historic church, or you'd like to find out more about the gospel of Jesus, please visit our website at oldsouthnbpt.org. The peace of Christ be with you.